Hey, everybody, welcome to episode number 92 of the Deaf Free Dad podcast. So I get this question often. Hey, Brad, I want to start saving for my kids. So when and how should I start doing this if I'm still working on paying down debt or, say, even building my emergency fund? Is this something that I should consider right now? We are going to answer this question and discuss this hot topic on today's show. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Debt Free Dad Podcast, where we're helping normal, everyday people learn how to save money and kick debt so they can live a happier and stress-free life. Now here's your host, Debt-Free Dad, Brad Nelson. Hey, what is up, everybody? You can find me on Facebook, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram. Just search Brad Nelson, Debt-Free Dad. And uh, again, welcome to today's show. we got a fun topic we're going to be talking about today, and it's all about saving for your kids and if you should save and if you can save and choose to save when do you start and today we're just going to be sharing a little our experience and and really just our opinions i mean by all means guys you uh have got to make some a lot of these decisions for yourself and for your own family so a lot of what we're today sharing today is really just our opinions on this it's not like set in stone like this is exactly the way that it needs to be. But we get this question often enough, and and I like this question because we are terrible savers. In fact, we, we're going to have a little bit of some, some information I want to share with you on saving and why Americans are so bad at saving here in just a second. But, uh, you know, I think personally, one of the best things that you can pass on to your kids is financial wisdom, is really the financial basics. A lot of people sometimes maybe get overwhelmed with, okay, what what exactly should I be teaching my kids? How can I make sure they're getting set up for, you know, success in life when it comes to their money? And, and people ask me these questions. It's like, honestly, just focus on the basics. And, and focusing on the basics means like helping them create good financial habits and behaviors. And I think one of the best ways that you can do that is leading by example, is, is doing it in your own life. Give your kids the example of how they should handle their money. Like if you're stressing about your finances, if you're relying on credit cards, if, if you're going into debt, if, if you're talking negatively about money or budgeting or you have a negative financial mindset, guess what? <laughs> it is highly likely that your kids are going to have that same exact experience with finances because they're looking at you. Now, that's not a guarantee, but it is very likely that it's going to happen because you are their best example. And again, when you're looking at the statistics of nowadays of almost eight out of 10 people are living paycheck to paycheck, according to careerbuilder.com, this is why this show exists. This is why our company exists because we can do better. We can improve our finances, but also the basics, you know, things like budgeting, you know, just teaching them simple budgeting uh, skills at a young age and even as they're teenagers and getting them involved with your budget so they can understand like what it actually takes to run a household. Obviously, staying out of debt is a good example. Staying away from debt as much as possible is a great example. And then ultimately is helping them create a long-term habit of saving. And if you can help them create that habit, and again, I know it's never going to be perfect, but if you can create that habit early enough, we're going to share some staggering numbers with you here that will show you the power of saving early and saving consistently over time. Um, and, And you could have a dramatic impact on their life. I I, I mean, I, I just see it. It's it's there. And, and you can bless your kids with that by giving them the education, but also even maybe starting an early savings account for them. What are your guys' thoughts on saving for your kids? And, and where do you guys fit in on this? And what are your opinions? Yeah, I mean, I mean, so this, for me, when we talk about, you know, teaching your kids and, you know, for my, this, for me, this is very personal because this was like one of our big whys of getting out of debt is I grew up hearing from lots of people you'll always have a credit card. You'll always have a car payment. You'll always have bills. You'll always have, you know, just basically you'll always be in debt. So that's the way I grew up. It's the way we lived our life. We just, we had bills and we, we struggled and struggled and struggled until we didn't want to do that anymore. And I think if we wouldn't have done that, our kids would have taken on the same mentality, probably would have taken out student loans, probably would have went away to school, done all the things that we would have taught them to do because that's, that's just what you do. Um, but on the flip side of that, we chose the other route, the, the kind of the, the route many, not many people take. And we got out of debt, paid everything off, but through that whole process, we really, we walked them through that too. Like we didn't have small Christmases. We didn't have less stuff. We didn't sell our big house and move to a smaller house and not sit down and explain 
why and what we did wrong and why we, you know, we basically just kind of fell on our sword and really kind of walked through that. But now we here we sit on the flip side of that. My son's a senior in college. He's cash flowed his entire education. He's going to graduate with no debt and a good amount of money still left in the bank, um, which he's planning to save for a car and then eventually move out. My daughter's just started college, has a healthy savings account, is paying her school all with cash, does not have, has no debt. Um, and my son who's 16 is working and has way more money at 16 in his savings account than I had <laughs> when I was 35 years old, you know? And honestly, it's, it's really through, I think through us and through teaching and coaching and showing and explaining, um, that we feel that that's the reason. Um, and I, and for us, it's like, we feel like we're kind of changing our, our family, the future family, you know, as they have kids, we hope that they pass on these things to them and it just keeps multiplying that and kind of doing away with that old mentality of, you know, you'll always have bills. You'll always have debt. You'll always have this. It's like, yeah. you don't, it's not necessary. You don't have to live like that. Right. And to be clear, you, um, when it comes to the, you guys saving for them, you've, you guys have saved nothing for them, correct? Correct. So we they are, have, they are doing this all on their own. Yeah. We had, we had not saved anything for them. I and mean, we probably have a few hundred dollars in savings bonds that we'll give them at some point. <laughs> <laughs> but as far as any significant amount of money to help them, um, where we've been able to obviously help them now is, you know, like my oldest lives at home. You know, we don't really, you know, we are able to help them in different ways, but from a financial standpoint, we've not paid for any sort of that sort of expenses or anything because we had to write our ship, you know, at some point I want to retire at some point I want to have a life and, and I for sure don't want to get 20 years down the road. And then I'm depending on my kids to support me because I literally yeah. just did nothing. Um, I don't want to do that either. So I, I, we feel like we have to take care of us and just our personal opinions on it are, we just don't feel that pressure from society that college is my responsibility to pay for. Like, you know, if you want to go, like for me, you need to have skin in the game and go. Cause yeah. I, I never wanted to spend a ton of money on college. And cause I know I went to college and I was like, yeah, I don't want to do this no more. And if I spent a lot of money and my kid walked out, we'd be, <laughs> that wouldn't be good for me. I'd probably have a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> Well, how about um, you, Amber? What are your feelings on this? I mean, we didn't save anything because we didn't have it to save. We weren't savers. We never saved anything for even us. So, and then uh, when we started our, our debt-free journey, we still didn't try and save for her to go to college. She ended up working for herself and paying for herself, but we are now saving for her daughter. So we're yeah. saving for our granddaughter and we're putting money away and she throws in what she can when she wants to for her daughter, but that just became what we wanted to do for our granddaughter. So we are saving for her education. Yeah. Um, we just skipped a generation. Yeah. Well, that's awesome though. That's awesome that you're able to do that. But I think, you know, there is this, like you said, Ryan, there is this pressure, you know, that we have to do this. And I think to be clear on this show, I think and from, from my personal standpoint, I think you as the parent need to make the decision. I, I, I don't feel that there is just, the one way and that's the only way. I think I think you guys as as parents to your kids need to make the decision about what's going to be best for you and, and for you guys. And and we're going to talk a little bit about at least in my opinion, my personal opinion, when is the right time to start saving like from a financial standpoint. But um, you know, kind of piggyback on what but on what you said Ryan is that you know, when you when you're talking about saving for your kids college, I too am somewhat of a firm believer of I am not saving enough money to give my kids a full ride in college. That's not my goal for college. I'm saving enough money that I'm going to be able to help them through it because I've seen what, and, and that's if they decide to go, maybe he'll, maybe they'll decide to go in the trades. Maybe, you know, maybe they'll try to decide to do something else. But if they do decide to go, I wanted to be able to have the ability to be able to help them at least get them through as they, as they got started. But there is definitely going to be some shared responsibility. There's no question. When they start getting jobs when they're teenagers, they're going to start thinking about some of this stuff. And and no, you're not going to go to the most expensive schools. And you're going to go to something that's reasonable that can still get you a great education. Because I, I agree. I think um, 
you know, they do have to have some skin in the game. They really do. And and I, that's just, again, that's my opinion. Uh, there are parents who believe that they're going to give their kids that that full ride to college. That's fine, too. Uh, you got to decide what's going to be uh, best for you guys. All right. But let's go back to this whole savings thing. You know, why aren't we good at saving? And, and why is this something that you should really try to help your kids create a habit to start saving early, right? Even if you don't save an amount of money for them, but you get them to start saving. Here's why. This is an article written written on gen.medium.com, written by Dwyer Gunn. Why are Americans so bad at saving? In recent years, psychologists and economists have identified a number of reasons why so many people struggle to save money. The most significant culprit is what's known as present bias. That is an unwillingness to delay a present gratification, saying eating out in order to achieve a future, a fatter savings account, mind you, despite having reported a willingness to do so in the past, meaning that people say, I want to save. I want to have money in my retirement. I want to have a bigger savings account for an emergency fund. But when the opportunity comes for them to do it, they choose the more pleasure type purchase, which is going out to eat, right? They say this, they say when people make plans for the future, they think giving up some money and putting it into savings account is a good idea because they're going to earn interest and use that money to retire, says Stephen Meyer, a professor at Columbia Business School. But then when tomorrow or next week becomes today, actually the cost of doing that is just too high for people. Meyer's research has found that people who are especially present biased have higher credit card debt even after controlling for demographic characteristics. There are other factors to blame, namely a lack of financial literacy and what psychologists call exponential growth bias, which is the tendency to underestimate the magic of compound interest, meaning that it's easy for you to justify, well, it's only a few dollars. But what if you only put that only a few dollars into an interest-growing savings account and you let that just sit for a while, right? That's what they're talking about. And they're talking about a lot of people have a hard time grasping the concept of how powerful compound interest can be. So first, let me share a little bit about how I feel. And you guys can give your guys' opinion on this. In fact, I welcome you guys too. But here's what I feel is is when you can start saving and when you should start saving for your kids. Like if you're actively listening to this show and you're getting out of debt, building your emergency fund, um, getting your situation straightened out, I think you should concentrate on that first and foremost. I do not feel like you should be saving for your kids at this moment, all right? Because you are going to retire one day. You do have to get yourself in a better place because there's going to come a time and a place where your kids are going to be out on their own. And if you didn't get yourself in a a good place because you were concentrating so much on them, what happens to you now, right? Time is is the most precious thing. And the sooner you get out of debt, the sooner you do this stuff, the better it's going to be because the sooner you can start saving for your future and your retirement, all right? So at the minimum, what I recommend, again, is having a fully funded emergency fund, which is at least three to six months. So you have a three to six month savings account where if you lost your job, lost your income, you could survive a three to six months. If you have that, you could check it off. Yes, I have that. I would also recommend that you have minimal debt. Now, I prefer no debt. That's me personally outside of a mortgage. But I'm talking minimal debt, as especially when it comes to like high interest credit cards. Like if you got a car payment that's reasonable or if you've got a reasonable student loan, like those might be things that you could negotiate into this deal, right? But for me, like I want to have no debt outside of a mortgage, all right? And then also you're fully funding your own retirement. And this one is the one where most people are missing. In fact, I have conversations. People will message me and say, Brad, I want to start saving for my kids. What's the best place to do that? Can you tell me? And the first thing I ask them is, number one, do you have an emergency fund? Do you have a three to six month emergency fund? And are you fully funding your emergency or your retirement? And almost all the time, all the answers are no. And I say, the last thing you need to be thinking about is saving for your kids right now. (laughs) The thing you need to be thinking about is saving for you, for your emergencies, short-term emergencies, and for that long-term retirement savings plan. Once that's done, then we can start talking about saving for your kids. Because again, you, and I know this sounds selfish, but you are priority number one. You are not obligated to give your kids a giant savings account when they become an adult. That's not part of the plan, I don't think. Now, if you can, and you have the financial ability to do so, that's a different discussion. But that's my viewpoint. What do you guys feel about this? So for me, I travel a lot for work and I fly a lot. And so when we talk about this, if you fly and if you've flown, 
and they talk about in the event of, lo- of losing cabin pressure and those little masks drop, what do they tell you if you have kids? You put your own mask on first before you put the kid mask on your kids. And they tell you that because if you don't, you're going to pass out and you're not going to be able to help your kids. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> it's very similar to, in my opinion, it's like, yeah, you've got to take care of yourself first. And I think for us, if I go back and I think like while we were in debt, there were times when it was like, oh, we should really save for our kids. But there were times where it was really tough. And it's it sounds great to save for your kids, but you still own and control all of that money. So even though you're quote unquote saving for your kids, when times get tough, are you financially disciplined enough to not touch that money that you're saving for your kids? Exactly. Because it's one thing to say, I want to save for my kids. Great. Awesome. But if you're in debt, you're not financially responsible, you're doing all the wrong things, no matter how much money you put in there, it's just going to tempt you. Like if you don't have your own retirement, I can pretty much guarantee you, you're probably going to end up taking whatever you're saving for your kids because I know I, I probably would have done that because um, there were times we were really tight on money. And if I had been saving, I probably would have been like, yeah, they don't know about it. Yep. Like, you <laughs> like, know, like, the I time I, I, like the time I busted into my son, my one-year-old son's piggy bank, it took $200 to go to a concert. Right. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> totally I did mean, it. Totally did it. Yep. I mean, I, I, so for me, I, I just really think it's important. I mean, I think there's this immense pressure these days, you know, over the years that it's like, we owe our kids all this stuff. We owe them college. We owe them like, we have to say, we got to do all these things. It's like, I'm not saying it's not a great goal to have, but like kind of going back to what you said, it's like, you got to just be right with yourself and doing all the right things. And then, yeah, do that hundred percent. You know, if we, if we were not in debt years ago, maybe we would have done it and it would have been fine and everything would have been great. But I know if I was back where I was and all in debt and really bad, even if I was saving for them, I just don't think it would have, I don't think they would have ended up with anything. Cause I think we would have probably taken it. Yeah. You would have, it, it technically our money still. So yeah, you would have busted. Well, into the account, yeah. See, I left college and I had a tons of debt. And I just paid it off a few years ago. So I don't want that for our granddaughter. I don't want her to have that. So I, we, and we're in a place now where we can put that savings away and save it for her. And that's what we've been doing. And it, we're in a government kind of funded thing. So we can't touch it. Yep. I, like we just can't pull it out or we lose what the government's funded for us so far. Right. Right. And see, and I think, I think those are two different scenarios right there. And I agree with both of them. Like there's a scenario where, you're just not ready to do it. You're not in a place to do it. And then there's a scenario, like you said, Amber, where you are in a good place. You've walked the walk. You've gotten yourself out of debt. You've gotten your stuff straight. And now you're in a position where you can financially not only put yourself first, which you are, but you're also able to now start using that money to help out other people in your family. And I think those are two different scenarios, and, and I agree with both of them. I really do. And and let's play what if. Like, what if you're in a scenario like Amber, and let's talk a little bit about that. And, and, and again, if you're not in this place just yet, this is a great goal to have. For me personally, this is something that I wanted to start for my kids. And I'll share a little bit about what we're doing right now. Um, and then we'll share a little bit about some things that you can start looking at if you're getting to the position where you can start saving for them because there are some cool things that you can start looking at. But first, let's just play what if, all right? This is why I think making it a goal to maybe save for your kids I think is, is pretty powerful. Is long, again, there's a, there's, there's a handshake here. The savings part on your part, but also the education you're giving them on how to use that money responsibly. That needs to be part of it. Like you can't just wait till they're 18 or 21 or whatever and just hand them this money and say good luck and they're going to make all the right decisions without the education and the wisdom that you're going to teach them, right? I think those- Not my 18-year-old self. (laughs) Those things have to go hand in hand. And I think that's the scary part about this. I'm a little nervous about it like, because we are saving for both of our kids. I'm a little nervous about it. I mean, there's going to be a good chunk of change in there for them when they get to that age. And um, I'm a little, I'll be honest, I'm going to be a little nervous about it. But at the same time, I'd rather be nervous about it than saying- we had the we had the ability to do it and we and we didn't you know i'd rather i'd rather try and and see what we can do but anyways let's play what if let's talk about this math, mathematical explosion called compound interest now compound interest occurs when interest gets added to the principal amount invested or borrowed and then the interest rate applies to the new larger principal basically it is essentially interest building upon interest with over time 
leads to exponential growth. We're talking explosive growth, all right? The key to this is time. Compound interest, when it comes to compound interest, building compound interest and building that savings account, time is everything. The sooner you start, the, the better off it's going to be. And that's why like when we talk about the debt freedom success path that we share here on the debt free or on the debt free debt podcast and inside roots where we teach it inside of our membership program, we teach people, it's like, we want you to do this as like quick. Like this isn't like a slow walk because we want you to get out of debt so you can start taking advantage of this mathematical explosion called compound interest. All right, guys. So let's say you invest a dollar per day for your kids until age 18. So again, that's just $31 a month times 12 months, $372 per year times 18 years, that means you're going to save $6,696 in a savings account for them. Now, instead of putting it maybe into a savings account, maybe instead you put this into the market, right? Say you put this into an investment vehicle. We're going to talk about some of these things like a custodial account or even like a kid's Roth IRA, something like that, right? And let's say that investment averages 8.5% over those 18 years that you're putting this money in. Your child would have $14,093 by age 18, basically doubling the money that you put in. Now, let's say your child keeps that money in that account and doesn't touch it or add to it until they're 65 or, or 67, okay? So they've done nothing. So at age 18, like you give them money, they don't touch it, they just leave it where it is, you've taught them the education, you've passed down this wisdom, and they habitually just leave it alone, all right? At 8.5% until age 65, that $14,000 would turn into $894,255 just by leaving it in the account. They didn't put anything else into it over that time period. That is the power of compound interest. Or let's play what if even further. What if you taught them or they took, again, that wisdom and education and you guys discuss, hey, instead of putting that $31 a month, what if instead we did $100 per month? What if you just did $100 per month until age 67? That's it. We're just upping it to 100 bucks, never changing it ever again. And they're going to consistently save that $100 month after month, year after year until age 67. Earning the same 8.5%, they would have 1.7, almost $1.8 million in their retirement account. Now, that is the power of compound interest, and that's how powerful this can be in getting people started early, especially your kids, in this habit of saving. And even if at the end of the day, you don't save for them from age zero to 18, if you can at least get them to start when they're teenagers, very much like Ryan said, and getting them to start habit of saving, putting that money in a savings account, so right when they get that job out of high school or even college, they're already starting to take advantage of investments and putting that money away. Guys, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to talk about some of the things you could start looking at for your kids and some of these investment vehicles that you can start putting this money into. Uh, stay tuned. Hey, if you love planners, this is for you. But do you know why planners frustrate me? Because they only really get it half right. Now, sure, they're really good and fancy about helping you manage your time, which is really important, obviously. That's what a planner's for. But where they get it wrong is money, the second most valuable resource in our lives. Most planners don't include any financial planning, things like you know, keeping track of paydays, bills, due dates, spending, yearly expenses, budgets, cash flow planning, debt elimination plans, and goal planning, right? None of that stuff. That's a real pain. And then what? Then you got to create your own and some silly binder, right? And who has time for all of that stuff? So instead, what happens? Nothing, right? A lot of people tend to ignore their finances even more and things only get worse. Well, that all ends today because I am so excited to announce and release my brand new, totally awesome debt freedom planner. This thing's awesome, by the way. Now, before you say, Brad, I've already got a planner. This is not an ordinary day planner. This is the Debt Freedom Planner, which is a companion tool that works with your day planner, and it's built to help you manage your money, pay off more debt, and melt away financial stress. And, and I believe this is the tool that a lot of people who want to take control of their finances have been waiting for. So head on over to therealdebtfreedad.com, click on the Debt Freedom Planner in the menu to get access to your planner today. All right, all right. So guys, today we are back talking a little bit about when and how you should start saving for your kids if you are using the debt freedom success path and getting out of debt. And so the first thing, 
um, you know, the first question is just how do you do this? Like where, where do you start looking? What are some ways to do this? And, and there's really some questions that you need to ask yourself before you do it. Number one is like, what are you saving for? Cause there's a lot of different things that you can save for. Like, are you saving just to get them started in a savings account? Are you saving to start thinking about paying for college? Like ultimately you have to decide what's the goal for the money. All right. What is the goal for the money? And decide on, that's going to help you decide the account type that you even look at, all right? Because there's going to be different rules for some of these account types that are out there based on what the goal is for the money, all right? This is also why you want to be really leery about people just giving you flippant advice about where to put the money. Because in a lot of cases, they'll just tell you, oh, you should just put it here. But they really don't know anything about what your goals are for that money. So you need to make sure you're asking yourself, what are the goals for the money? What is this account going to be used for? All right. You also want to think about what the time horizon is for this. All right. How soon are you going to need the money? That's also going to dictate probably a lot of what investment choices that you use and put into that. Like how much risk are you willing to take on? Right. So those are going to be some things that you're going to want to consider as well. All right. Also, you're going to want to be aware that any money saved that is legally owned by your child can affect financial aid for college. All right. Because there are some accounts that you can put money in. And we're going to talk about those things like custodial accounts, right? If you put money into a custodial, like if I put money and I have a custodial account for my son, if I put money into that, that money legally now belongs to him. I cannot go in and take it out. It is now my son's money legally. And it's actually against the law for me to go in there and take that money from him because it's technically his, right? So these accounts have different rules. So you want to make sure that you really look at the details of, okay, what, what accounts are we going to look at? Why are we going to do this and what makes the most sense for, for what our goal is for this money? All right. So let's talk about a few. And again, this is not an exhaustive list, guys. This is just giving you some of the more popular things that are out there. I encourage you to go out and do your own research, to read about this if this is something that's important to you. That's exactly what I did to learn about what was best for us. And this is just, again, to give you some ideas and some options of things that you can consider and hopefully point you in a direction of something that might interest you. Number one is obviously your plain, boring, general savings account, all right? Nothing wrong with this. Like if you just want something simple, you can just put it right into a savings account. Now, the downside is is it gets awful returns. Like you're not going to really gain any sort of advantage of compound interest because the returns are just very, very minimal. But it's simple and it also teaches the habit of saving, all right? And there's little risk. There's actually no risk in this, all right? It is like as simple as it gets when it comes to saving. We all know about those savings account, but that's genuinely an option depending on where you're at with your savings, okay? Another thing you can look at is obviously 529 college savings plans, okay? So some advantages of uh, 529 plans are they're federal and state. Most, ha most have tax benefits for federal and state. They're low maintenance and super easy to set up. In fact, when my daughter was born and we started hers, it literally took me, I think, at the most maybe 15 minutes to set the whole thing up. And that includes choosing the investment that we wanted it to go in, right? Uh, they are favorable for financial aid. Money is considered the parents and not the child's, which is important. So when your child goes to apply for financial aid, that money is not counted as actual income or owned by the child. So they could still get additional financial aid because it's counted as the parents, all right? There's a lot of flexibility. You can invest in a 529 plan in pretty much any state that you want to. So just about every state, you know, you can go, like I'm in Wisconsin, that's the one I invest in, but if I wanted to invest in one like in a different state, I could, I'd have that option to do so. So again, why would you do that? Because each state has different investment choices and things that you can look at. Okay. So that's again, why it's important to kind of learn a little bit about this stuff and what's going to make the most sense for you. Other people can contribute to a 529 plan, which is pretty cool. So again, if you're done getting stuff for your kids, like if you have a lot of family and you just get tons of stuff for birthdays and Christmas or whatever it might be, like you can easily just say, Hey, look, here's the link to my child's 529 plan. You can contribute to this. In fact, we would much rather you do that than fill our house with more stuff. All right. So that's pretty cool. So if you want somebody else to contribute to it, you can do that too. All right. Also the account holder controls the account and you can change the beneficiary. So for instance, if my son Noah decides not to go to college and my daughter Avery decides to nine years later, I could change the beneficiary over to her and I would not lose out any of that money. All right. So that's the nice thing. There's a lot of flexibility there. Some disadvantages, obviously it's a 529 college savings plan. So it must be used for educational expenses. And if you don't use it for educational expenses, you could be 
uh, subject to income tax and penalties for withdrawal for non-educated type expenses. Obviously, there's fees. Direct plans are cheaper. So for instance, if you open up your own 529 plan through your state, that's probably going to be cheaper in some cases, maybe in many cases, than say opening it up through like a financial advisor who sells plants. All right. So you can just open it up through your state on your own. Again, do your research. Just go probably search your state's 529 plan. Very simple, very easy to do. All right. Let's talk a little bit about some of the custodial accounts. Okay. So these are acronyms of UGMA and UTMA. All right. Uniform Gift to Minors Act and Uniform Transfers to Minors Act. Now, this is different. This is the situation where I was speaking of like when I like this is one account that we have set up for our son. So when I put in and it's a small amount we put in every month, it's not like some extravagant amount. It's a small amount we put in every month and that money is now his. All right. Now, as the owner of the account, I am dictating what investments that money is going into. But legally, that money belongs to my son once it goes into that account. All right. So this is a direct asset to your child. All right. Now, the beautiful thing about this, the advantage is that you can use this money for any kind of expense. Like, for instance, when he becomes old enough to drive and he wants to buy a car, well, that money's been sitting there. He could take that money out and we could use that to buy a vehicle for him if he chooses to. There's also no contribution limits to this. All right. So we could invest a ton of money into this if we really, really wanted to. Now, the first $1,050 in gains is tax free, and the second $150 is taxed at the child's tax bracket. So there are tax, you know, things that you got to be aware of for here that you will have to potentially pay taxes on it, especially as this account gets bigger, because you'll be much more likely to obviously make more money on it, the more money that's in there and the more compound interest is growing. All right. Some disadvantages, the child gets full control of the account at age 18 to 21. All right. You can set it up at age 18 or 21. When does the child get full access to the account? Now, remember, it's always the child's, but now it's really theirs. Like you have no more control over it. It's all theirs right? Now, the money placed in the account is irrevocable. Again, meaning that it's put in there, you can no longer take that money out. I want to be very, very clear with that, right? Now, the money in the account is the child's money, so it will be considered also the child's money if they're applying for financial aid. So, if if your child is for sure going to be going to college, you may think twice about maybe investing a ton of money into an account like this if you're hoping that they're going to be able to apply for financial aid and get some help. Because if, if you put a bunch of money in this, that's going to be counted against them. So you want to be very, very careful with that. And then obviously, you know, possible tax implications. Make sure you talk to a tax professional if you're planning on doing this. Find out what you need to be aware of when you're putting money into this account so you know when it comes to tax time. All right. One of the cooler ones that I like is the kids Roth IRA. I like this one. And uh, this is going to be something that we're going to be looking at for both of our kids. Uh, but the advantage is, is that they can start retirement early. This is what I love about it, all right? Uh, they can invest in pretty much whatever they would like. And the Roth, being that it's a Roth, the investment grows tax-free because you're investing with after-tax dollars. Now, you can also do a traditional IRA. And the tax deductions you'll get on that is because you're investing with pre-tax dollars. So there are some tax benefits to that. I'm a big fan of the Roth, but you can also look at the the traditional if you want. Now, there are some investment limits up to this. You can invest up to $6,000 per year per child. Now, the key thing here is that they have to have earned income. Now, you could look at that as a disadvantage. I look at that as an advantage because now they are working at a job. So let's say, for instance, my son Noah, he's 15 years old. He goes out and starts working at a fast food restaurant or a golf course, or he starts making money. He can start taking his own money now and investing it into his own Roth before he's even age 18. I think that's pretty freaking cool. And especially if you're starting to teach them the responsibility of, the, and again, this habit of saving and saving early and saving often. I mean, how cool is it that they can start that early? But again, the key is they have to have earned income. All right. There are plenty of other disadvantages and things that you can talk about with a lot of these different things. There are also things like you can get into even talking about saving for insurance. Like you start looking at whole life policies universal life policies, which I'm not personally huge fans of, but those are options as well. But there are a lot of different things that you can get your kids started on early. All right. But the key is to this show is number one is to know if you're ready to do so. Like, are we at that point? And I think that we were pretty clear today. Like if you're working your way out of debt, if you're still building your emergency fund, if you're still getting yourself in a better place where you're not feeling as much stress, like I don't personally feel that this is the best time to do that. I would put it on your goal board for like, this is something we eventually want to get to. And that's what I had to do. 
I wanted to be eventually be able to do this for my kids. We finally got to that point, and it's super cool to be able to see that savings grow. And now that my son's getting older, I'm starting to get him involved in those conversations and showing him the account, showing him a little bit about how it's working, how it's growing. And it's exciting to be able to teach him even at a young age. So I'm hoping that it's going to pay off. Hey, hey, what's this I see? I thought this was a party. Let's do All right, all right. That's not means it's time for the celebrations of the show. And today we're kicking it off with Sherry Zolke. Sherry says, we have made $70 this month selling on Marketplace. I start my new job Monday. My paycheck will be going directly to debt. We have paid about $500 to a credit card and should have it paid off at the end of this month. That is awesome. Guys, a whole entire paycheck going towards paying off debt. That is, I love that's it. pretty awesome. Stephanie Barrett, we paid off an Affirm bill and got our savings to $1,000. Awesome job, Stephanie. Congratulations to you guys. Alessandra Sanchez, it's payday and all my bills were paid for the month at the beginning of the week. Amazing. Congratulations to you, Alessandra. Michelle Thompson Cheney, I think mine is a win and a behavior change. I shredded my credit cards. My husband and I only have one debit card between us and no credit cards. I didn't close any accounts but I definitely won't be using them. And that is a huge step. And we never encourage anyone to cut up credit cards here. It's not what we do, but I think it's a personal choice. But I know when I first cut them up, like that was a big step. That was like that. We're drawing a line in the sand. We ain't crossing over it. So that's a big win for you, Michelle. Congratulations. Katie Hatfield got a $440 monthly bonus from her cooking business, plus $56 commission on sales, sold some things on Poshmark, paying down debt with a growing snowball, paid down $200 in medical debt. Amazing. Congratulations, Katie. Uh, Nadine McClurg, I left my wallet at home to avoid pointless spending on coffee and snacks. <laughs> Only carry the necessary IDs and insurance. That's worked three times for me this week. <laughs> that is amazing. Huge congratulations to you, Nadine. Ryan, maybe you need to do that. Lay off your Starbucks, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just leave your wallet at home. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, thanks for hanging out with us here today. We love your feedback, and it also helps us grow our YouTube show. So please give us a like or leave us some honest feedback on this video. And if you want the latest from the show, obviously be sure to hit that notification bell and subscribe to our channel. And for the latest resources, or if you want more information on how to kick debt and financial stress, please be sure to check out the links in this video or head over to the real debtfreedad.com. We'll see you guys on an upcoming show. Take care.